Okay, here's the idea. I thought I would sit down and record a series of shorts. And the reason why is because what's come across my desk recently have been um, some amillennial and postmillennial objections to dispensationalism. Some of the responses that might have come from the dispensational camp ill-informed, um, not accurate, weak. Sometimes the questions are framed from the amillennial camp as far as uh, what the various positions are within dispensationalism, I think are misstated as well. Um, sometimes just enough of a, a tweak or a misstatement or a misplacement as far as the timing of the way things are supposed to happen that it misrepresents dispensationalism. I just want to have a good, honest conversation on, on the subject. The reason why is because uh, there's a lot of back and forth between several camps as far as end times eschatology, what the views are on Bible prophecy. And um, I, I think the the crux of the matter comes down to hermeneutics. And for those who may not know, they may have heard the term, but not really sure what it means. Hermeneutics, simply put, is just the way of reading and understanding the scripture. There are some basic rules that different camps will apply in how to read a scripture and understand a scripture for the best accuracy. Without belaboring that, I'd rather cover that under each question because I thought maybe I would hit one question or one subject per short video instead of lecture on each subject or on the whole of the subject or I am not a professor but I am a Bible teacher and I have been at this for a number of years. Um, let me give you a little background of what informs my position and where I'm at. Just so you know how ancient I am, uh, junior high school, I came to Christ. That would be in 1971. For over 50 years studying the Bible, um, I was blessed to have a couple of really good mentors. Now, here's what happened to me. It's kind of funny. The guy that led me to Christ was nearing college age while I was in junior high. He was a neighbor and a good friend of my brother's. So they were already in high school but getting ready to graduate and go out into to college level. Anyway, his name's Jay. And Jay shared the gospel with me. My brother did a couple of times. And over a year, I thought about the gospel and what it meant to me. And I remember growing up and I always wanted to be, I thought it would be cool to be a disciple of Christ. Back in Back in my day, they used to actually show some of these Easter movies and Christmas movies on TV, um, you know, The Robe, Ben-Hur, those kinds of movies, and they were not edited. Nowadays, they edit Charlie Brown cartoons with Linus giving the speech on the stage and sharing the Gospel of Luke. I was always very God aware. I was not raised in church, but was always disappointed that I wasn't alive during the time of Christ because I thought it would be cool to be one of his followers, to be a disciple of Christ. And I remember a few times as a child even praying that way and expressing that kind of regret and remorse and how sorry I was about that. And anyway, I came to Christ because he drew me. No man comes to Christ unless the Father draws him. We know this from Scripture, right? And I'm not going to get into the whole... Arminianism versus Calvinism thing. I'm not going to get into that. I came up in an Arminian church, um, a Baptist church, a GERB church. The fellow Jay, who uh, prayed with me that, that one day, it was a June 30th, 1971, as I recall. His background was more Presbyterian and his likes and the things he read and so forth. I did not get into any eschatology, obviously, at that point. He was teaching me things. He was loading me up with things by, um, you know, Arthur Pink and Spurgeon and, and many great writers, great preachers in that day um, and before, obviously, well before. 
And he was just loading me up with books and teaching me how to read the Bible, how to study the Bible, how to look for keywords. He was showing me how to use the um, concordance in the back of my Bible, the indexes, the cross references. He he was very a very good mentor. He was very thorough. And I was overwhelmed but loving it and reading a lot. Meanwhile, our, our church was searching for a youth pastor because that group was growing. It was in the Southwest in the early 1970s was that big 70s kind of a mini revival that happened in the Southwest. And out of that, for instance, was born the Calvary Chapel movement and things. And I still remember um, on Saturday nights, a bunch of us piling into a car, whoever had the car keys in that car that they could get a hold of, and driving a few minutes to Costa Mesa, California, where Chuck Smith had a, a big giant three ring circus tent set out in the middle of a field in Costa Mesa, and they had those Saturday night concerts in the summertime. See, I'm really aging myself here now. So um, among the youth, the um, growth was phenomenal at that time. And the church I was at wanted to meet that need and find somebody who was good and solid. So through a connection from the pastor, actually through his daughter, who um, I think at one time went to Bible college with um, Dr. John MacArthur, um, was still in touch with him. She knew uh, various people from um, Grace Community Church, and it was still a really new church. So this would have been a year and a half, two years later, maybe. My dates kind of run together. It was getting close to late 1972 or getting into 1973. She had said, um, I know a nice young man at MacArthur's church. You know, what did I, you know, bring him in and introduce you to him? You know, so she said this to her dad, the pastor. Okay. Did I say she was a PK? She was a PK. So she introduced Mark. And he um, he was, uh, he, he came into the church and we kids, you know, really liked him. His teaching style was a lot like MacArthur. He was mentored by um, MacArthur through while he was attending Biola University. Um, Bible Institute of Los Angeles. For those out here, East Coast, who don't know what a Biola is, that's what it was. His background, obviously, is similar to um, MacArthur's. And Ma even MacArthur back in those days was a little bit less reformed than he is now. Over the years, he's kind of just keeps sliding into more and more reformed. However, um, his background was more dispensational. The big difference is, if you don't know, are if you're more reformed, those folks tend to lean toward differences in eschatology, which is teachings of end times, and ecclesiology, things that have to do with church. Very often in the Reformed camp, not always, but very often in the Reformed camp, you will find differences such as you might find infant baptism, pedo baptism, however you want to call it, uh, among the Presbyterian churches and the more covenantal churches and many of the Reformed churches. Many of the Reformed churches do not teach Pedo baptism. So there'll be some differences, but the big difference that affects the major breach between dispensationalism and Reformed theology will be the view of Israel and what God has done with Israel. Is God done with Israel? Is God done permanently with Israel? God is not done with Israel, but it's one view. God is not done with Israel, but as far as some of those prom promises and things they've now been applied instead to the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. It's a broad palette, let me tell you, because among reform groups, you'll have four or five major differences or perspectives on that, and the same in the dispensational camp. So there's a blend in between. One extreme will be not really what you'd call the dispensational camp, but where the perspective on, on Israel really affected church history was obviously from the Catholic Church prior to the Reformation. And that is that um, the Jews have rejected their Messiah, Jesus. So because of that, stick a fork in them, they're done. There, there was 
great persecution from the Catholic Church. The Knights Templar, for instance, they sent the Knights Templar out and they went after the Muslims. And then when the Muslims or when the Knights Templar were done slaughtering the, the Muslims in Jerusalem, they turned immediately toward whatever Jews, anybody that was Palestinian over there um, in Jerusalem, in old Jerusalem, Palestine, and went after them and started slaughtering the Jews. Um, no regard for them whatsoever because they're just a bunch of barbarians, heretics who turned on their Savior. So God is, God is done with them, and now it's all about the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church. There's that extreme. And then there's the other extreme to where you'll have somebody like a John Hagee who takes an, an opposite. So I'm, I'm covering two heretical perspectives here. The opposite heretical perspective will be all embracing where you'll have a John Hagee, for instance, who will try to say things like, uh, because Israel was God's chosen people, that they don't even have to know who Jesus was to be saved, and they're going to be saved because they're God's chosen people. So all the Jews are going to be saved. So there's two different camps, both heretical, and then you've got a, the broad palette in between. So those are the differences. Those what are re really um, inform the argument the most is what you do with, with Israel. Because that will inform how you read the Bible. That will inform um, with what lens you want to look at various texts and what your hermeneutic, again, Bible interpretation, interpretation will do. To get back to where my background with, is with Jay, who, whose background, his contacts were more people from the Presbyterian camp. Think R.C. Sproul, that kind of thing. Westminster Confession of Faith, that kind of thing. Obviously, yes, Jews can still be saved, individual Jews or whatever, but for the most part, God has washed his hands with, you know, they, they had their shot, the Jewish nation had their shot, now it's, you know, Israel had their shot, now it's um, the nations. Then also I was learning and I was hearing from Mark, I was hearing from that camp, the more dispensational view, and that is that God is not done with Israel yet. Um, yes, Israel is in judgment, but their time will come. All the prophecies of the Old Testament will be fulfilled. Uh, many of the questions that I'm going to try to answer in shorts, am I, am I running too long here to be doing my first short? Probably. But will be something more in the middle to where uh, many of the objections I hear is that, well, no, God's not done with Israel yet, um, but it's not quite the same as it, as it was. God has fulfilled many of those promises. They're done. So you are misapplying your timeline. You're misreading the scriptures. Um, you're too literal. So that's the argument that comes up too. And I don't want to run ahead of myself because we are going to address that. And in fact, that will be the first official short. This one I would call an introduction. So I want to address these issues and try not to open the fire hose and do too big an info dump for people who don't want that. But at the same time, I just want to be um, honest and answer both because I started off more Armenian over the years as I read the Bible and um, got into greater depth with the scripture, going to various Bible seminary, Bible colleges, different courses and things I've taken and studying over the years, putting my nose in the book, listening to lots of great preachers from R.C. Sproul to John MacArthur, points in between and on either extreme outside of them even. You know, I, we, as we all tend to do, I settle in my own comfort zone. So this is going to be my comfort zone. I'm going to share with you what my comfort zone is, I guess, and where I land on all of this. And um, I don't try to straddle bro boats. Um, that's not the point of this here. Um, I'll show you some answers I settled on, including some answers I settled on that I was not comfortable with at first that I had to really grapple with, and it took more study and more prayer and getting into the Word, and it took several months to land on some answers. So, that being the case, I want to answer some post-mill objections to dispensationalism, try to answer those fairly and honestly. So, so much for the introduction. Um, now you know a little bit about who I am and where I'm coming from.